Hey guys, and welcome to my presentation on the biochemistry of urushiol in poison ivy. And just for reference, there's a structure there in the bottom left of urushiol, but you will also see it later on. So, the biological function of urushiol. Now, it's best known to act as a human deterrent, causing those horrible rashes, and this is because of a type 4 hypersensitivity response. However, similar compounds have been known to have fungicidal activity. Um, however, the exact biochemical function of urushiol is actually unknown. Okay, so which plants actually contain urushiol? Uh, this is in the Anacardiaceae family, excuse my pronunciation there, um, and it's found in the vasculature system of all these plants. And these actually include the mango tree, cashew, poison ivy, the Asian lacquer tree. And you all have the similar structure shown again on the right um, with this catechol with, with, a, with an eye group that I'll go into explain in a, a few seconds. So, the general structure. On the bottom left, we have that catechol ring, and we see that the R group actually was a long hydrophobic acyl chain. Um, however, usual is not just one compound, it's actually a family of related compounds, and they have different um, modifications and variations, one of which is they have differing levels of unsaturation. The second of which is that this long hydrophobic acyl chain can contain 15 or 17 carbons. Interestingly, some recent evidence suggests that these are separated, so 15 carbon chain urushols are found more in resin ducts of poison ivy, whereas 17 carbon chains are found more in the cortex and vasculature tissue. And this could indicate some biosynthetic or functional even separation. In addition, uh, things like fitziol, which is produced in closely related plants to poison ivy have a slightly different structure with the relative position of the hydroxyls and the R group are different, but also in the unrelated ginkgo tree, they produce anacardic acid, which actually, if you think about it, looks very similar to urushol here, except you have a carboxyl group instead of a hydroxyl group. Now, here's an interesting slide, and it goes into that the more CO2 in the atmosphere there is, uh, the more problems poison ivy causes. So this is because of increased growth rate of poison ivy, but there's also an increased proportion of urushiol that is polyunsaturated. And the high proportion of urushiol is polyunsaturated in a plant, it means that plant is more allergenic. So how do we make urushiol? Well, we, we don't really know right now, uh, but this is the possible biosynthetic pathway. So we start off on the far left with a 16 or 18 carbon fatty acyl CoA uh, with possible levels of unsaturation there as well. Then we combine with three malnal CoAs to act as two carbon donors to create this tetraketide intermediate here, uh, shown on the far right, using the uh, reactive cysteine uh, in an enzyme I'm gonna go into later. So from here, there's a cyclization reaction and a, a oxidative decarboxylation reaction to produce urushiol. Now, obviously, there's a lot of steps here, um, and it's thought that the primary enzyme involved in these steps is a type 3 polyketide synthase. So what this enzyme is thought to do is to uh, conduct the first possible two steps or two arrows here. So we'll add these malleal coas and then aid the cyclization reaction, but we're not sure whether it could also do some processing steps as well. Like I said, this hasn't been worked out or investigated in any manner yet. Uh, the polyketide synthase, especially the type 3, has evolved from duplication from a um, keto acyl synthase and there's also additional enzymes such as oxidative decarboxylases I talked about, but also possible desaturases involved in modulating um, the saturation content of that long hydrophobic tail of urushiol. So given we don't know the exact biochemical pathway by which you produce urushiol, you ask the question, well, how would we work it out? Uh, so I've constructed this slide here. This isn't the only way you can work out secondary metabolite biosynthetic pathways, but it's one of the ways in which it's done. So it involves expression analysis. So contained within that is transcriptome acquisition, annotation using blast searches, differential expression analysis between different tissues or between the same tissue in different responses. The secondary metabolites are often produced in response to some sign of stimuli. You can also use phylogenetic analysis. For example, if both the mango, the cashew and poison ivy both 
produce urushiol, then you can look for similarly conserved enzymes in these organisms. And finally, you need to validate all these candidate genes that you'll get from the above two analyses. This can include some in vitro enzyme assays, for example. So in addition to the very well characterized rash response you get when you come into contact with damaged poison ivy, I think it's important to also point out some of the positive things we can get out of knowing the biosynthetic pathway of urushiol. And this includes some very early studies that I'll put in the references later that show some urushiol derivatives have reverse transcriptase inhibition, reverse transcriptase being very important for HIV replication. But also some urushiols have also been shown to have some anti-tumor properties. So these could potentially in the future um, have some therapeutic value to us. So that's about it really. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for listening and getting this far. And I'd like to end with leaves of three, leave it be. The rashes are very bad. Okay, see ya.